Hi there. So um, firstly, I'd like to say a big thank you to Dr. Rohit Gupta for inviting me to uh, speak today. Um, what I'll do is I'll sort of introduce myself, sort of tell you who I am and my background, and then sort of discuss sort of the topic that we're going to be talking about for the next sort of 10, 10, 15 minutes. And that is uh, spinal manipulation. Um, so those of you that don't know who I am, my name is Giles Geyer and I'm a manual therapist. Uh, I have a degree in osteopathy uh, from the UK. Um, but I sort of have been working within the academic and lecturing field for the last sort of 10 years. So I am internationally published, uh, not just in scientific research, but in technique books on spinal manipulation, not just from an osteopathic background and perspective, but also from a chiropractic background. Um, I'm going to generalise the two uh, and basically refer to it as just spinal manipulation. So regardless of the philosophy, we're going to focus specifically on the modality, the, the, the technique itself. Um, and what I'm going to cover is I'm going to cover what manipulation is, what manipulation is not, some of the misconceptions, what the evidence is saying, what we are looking at now from a more of a neurophysiological paradigm, um, and also how you can utilize it within your therapeutic modality. Okay. I love manipulation. I like using that technique with my patients because I find it's a very effective tool. But what manipulation is not is a magic bullet. Manipulation is not a panacea to cure all ills. It is not going to fix anything. I'm going to say that again. Manipulation is not a magic bullet and it is not going to fix anything. What will fix the issue is about patient education, is about understanding looking at the biopsychosocial aspects of treatment. It's understanding that we need to create tissue resilience and getting the patient doing exercise rehab and possibly nutritional advice and stress management. What the patient does off the table is more important than what we do on it. I cannot stress that enough. The issue that a lot of therapists have started to become is they believe that manipulation is the only technique and that is all they do. They are basically just cracking and forgetting, all right, which I think is a fundamental flaw. So what is manipulation? Well, in its essence, although the therapies can't really degree, uh, agree on the actual definition, manipulation is a therapeutic procedure applied to a joint, working within the physiological range to improve the quality and quantity of that specific target area, okay? Um, it's a high velocity, low amplitude movement. So that means it's a fast, fast movement, but a very short distance. So you may see some practitioners doing big, big traction techniques and big thrust techniques. I don't personally think they're appropriate. That is what I would call a high velocity, high amplitude technique. What we focus on is the high velocity, low amplitude. Um, the key again with this is, is about patient safety. Manipulation is effective, it's very effective, but it should only be used with clinical rationale, it should only be used with effective case history taking, and it should only be used on an appropriate patient. It should not be used on everybody for everything. Manipulation should be used for a specific reason to achieve a desired outcome. If you're using manipulation without thought process and you're cracking everybody that just comes into clinical practice, that, in my opinion, is not therapy. You're basically becoming a protocol therapist, a protocol practitioner. You're not using your knowledge of anatomy, physiology, differential diagnosis to achieve the outcome. OK, you're basically guessing. Um, it's not magic. It is a technique. It's one of many, many techniques. Okay. The manipulation itself is a gentle and small separation of the articular surface. It's a gradual stretching of the articular tissues, a, a depressurization of a joint and, and a cavitation of a gaseous substance within that. That stimulus is causing an impact on the surrounding spinal paraspinal tissues, and we're eliciting a neurophysiological effect on the body. The manipulation technique, we have the localized, we have the segmental and the extra segmental modalities. We are 
affecting the body's central nervous system, the peripheral, and we're affecting the central nervous systems, okay? So ultimately, when we look at manipulation, we have to move away from this biomechanical paradigm, the idea of repositioning of joints. Manipulation, and when we look at the evidence and we look at what's currently out there in science and, and around the world, is has moved from biomechanics into a neurophysiological viewpoint. Manipulation is not just affecting the joint, it's affecting the brain. And that is fundamentally important when we look at what it is we're doing and why we are doing it. There are though still some significant misconceptions in manual therapy around manipulation. And I think it's valid that we talk about those in an open forum. Manipulation is not repositioning joints. You are not putting a joint back into position with manipulation. If you had done so, the joint was dislocated, okay? That is not what is happening. If you are telling people that you are correcting the pelvis or you are repositioning the vertebral structures, then you don't understand what manipulation is because that is not what is happening, okay? We are targeting an area, but we are not causing any change. There's no evidence to say there is any lasting positional change from manipulative technique. I'm just chucking it out there. We have to be realistic as to what it is and what it does and demystify some of the misconceptions that we as therapists are giving our patients and some of the misconceptions that these lecturers are teaching their students. When we look at the evidence in regards to um, how we choose an area to manipulate. I think we need to be quite objective. We look at our active and passive observations, we look at our testing, but we have to be realistic. A long time ago, I was trained in the concept of sort of motion, palpation and Friot's law. There is no evidence that that is effective. There's no evidence that motion palpation is an effective tool whatsoever to target or choose an area requiring manipulative technique. There is no evidence that says that that is effective. What you look at when we term examination is pain provocation tends to come out as an effective modality and also as part of your subjective examination. So if you're relying on solely motion palpation to try and assess these tiny intricate movements of the spine, evidence does not say you can do that. You can't feel one degree of rotation at the lumbar spine per segment. I can't feel one degree of rotation at L5. It's evidence-based, the evidence says it's impossible. I agree with that. What I can do is I can look arbitrarily at the movement and I can look at pain provocation. That, I think, is a, is a much more valid way of doing it. Um, if motion palpation is not an effective way to choose manipulation, and we're not repositioning of joints, and there is no lasting positional change, then, then then how can we be specific? Because I was trained to be joint specific. Um, I'm gonna target one joint and only affect that one joint. Well, unfortunately, after sort of 15 years, uh, I've come to the realization that that, again, is a misconception. You, you cannot be joint specific. There is no evidence to say that you can be joint specific. In fact, the opposite occurs. In the thoracic spine alone, the evidence shows that if you are targeting one vertebral segment, you have got around nine centimeters whereby you may manipulate something. Three and a half centimeters of error either side of that target segment. If you believe you are being joint specific and you are not affecting the areas above and below that target segment, then again, you are misinformed. Your intention may be to be specific. But the reality of the fact is that you are going to have effects on structures above and below your targeted area. I have to show, be honest, this is what we've published in our research. We were published last year, a big 6,000 word project, uh, 122 references, and it is freely available for you to read online. And we, because I love manipulation, but we have to put it into context as to what actually it is. Uh, when we stop mystifying it and tell people we're correcting the pelvis when actually we're not, um, 
I think it, it will become more of an appropriate technique to use in clinical practice. So I've sort of delved a little bit into some of the mysticism, the idea of bone setting and things like that. But, but what does the evidence say that is, it's very effective for? Well, in the biomechanical view, the muscular reflexogenic uh, aspect of manipulation has been shown to have a strong evidence base. If I manipulate an area, I will affect the alpha gamma motor neurons on the structures around it, and I can look at reducing tone. So. That, that's very, very good. There's evidence there that that, that is effective. Um, we look at the, uh, the, the, the concept of, of the neurophysiological response of manipulative technique on the ascending and descending inhibitory systems, the activation of the periaqual gray matter or the PAG, the, the release of the body's natural endorphins, the anti-inflammatory and tissue healing processes, pain gate mechanisms, the, the, um, the ability for the body to, to feel better, to move better arbitrarily, temporarily. So if we look at the neurophysiological process, when we boil it down to its simplicity, what manipulation does is it will very much temporarily make the patient feel a bit better, reduce their tone, improve their movement, and if we can make them feel better and move better, then we have a greater opportunity to then exercise and rehabilitate the patient, get them into an exercise phase as fast as possible. Um, I know I'm being quite simplistic, but, but if we are being realistic, yeah, manipulation is very effective at getting them moving and feeling better, but it's not magic. Remember guys, this is, this is a therapeutic technique and only one of many, many, many out there. Um, when we also look at the research that's been, been published over the last two years from uh, institutes such as the British Medical Journal, the BMJ, uh, and a variety of other National Health Service Institutes, when you look at what manipulation has been shown to be effective for, it's predominantly lower back pain. Okay. When we look at the actual evidence that is published and we look at the trials and we look at the statistics and we look at the case studies, the British Medical Journal said that manipulation or spinal manipulation was one of the non-drug therapeutic modalities that patients should consider if they have lower back issues, but it's a temporary process. Okay. The uh, American Institute of, Pharma, uh, of, of, um, of Doctors also agreed that manipulation was shown to be effective for lower back problems, but also for cervical pain and for the prevention or treatment of migraines and headaches. Great, okay, some good solid evidence there that manipulation is very, very effective for the treatment of musculoskeletal disorders. And that's what the research is showing. What the research is not showing and what the research hasn't shown is that manipulation can improve your health, yeah? It's not saying, you know, and, and hopefully I'm, I'm, I'm not here to offend people, I'm not here to tell people what you've learned is wrong, I'm just here to say that this is currently what we're looking at. There are people that are saying manipulation can help with autism, bedwetting, neurological problems such as, um, such as autism, um, mental health issues, fertility, uh, the, the workings of the liver, the kidney. Um, you know, those are unquantifiable claims. There are therapists that are saying that they can treat systemic conditions with manipulation. We can't. We have to be realistic that manipulation is a modality for the treatment of musculoskeletal disorders. It helps with a temporary change, a temporary window of opportunity, whereby we can use that modality to improve the movement, improve the temporary range, improve the patient's pain presentation, to allow them to exercise and rehab. That is why I will use it. It's part of my process. And that's another thing that we have to also think about is our clinical rationale. I think it is important I address the point that there are many, many practitioners out there using manipulation with no thought process. They are using prescriptive techniques or five techniques for everybody regardless of the condition. There is some research that was done in 2008 by Welsh and Boone that suggested that if you manipulate the cervical spine that you have an effect on the parasympathetic nervous system. Manipulation of the thoracic lumbar has an effect on the sympathetic nervous system. If you are basically cracking your patient from head to foot for every single ailment that walks in your door, there's a very high chance that you are going to hyperstimulate that person.
okay? Less is more, and that should be applied, in my opinion, across the whole of the therapeutic board. Less is more. If you are chucking tons of mud at something and hoping it sticks, that's not, in my opinion, effective therapeutic treatment. What I would say is I use manipulation where appropriate. I use as little as possible to achieve my desired outcome. If I'm using manipulation with no real thought process, I think you're on a sticky wicket. I think ultimately you need to have clear, concise rationale. Manipulation is a safe and effective modality when used appropriately. When risk comes into the fact is when the therapist is cavalier, they haven't done a case history, or they're using brute force and ignorance to create a manipulation. Ultimately, guys, to elicit the neurophysiological mechanisms, you don't have to hear the crack. You've got to understand that. You don't have to hear the crack to elicit the therapeutic benefits, okay? We need to explain to the patient, you don't need to hear the crack. Otherwise, they are going to always associate a positive therapeutic outcome with an audible cavitation. That is just not the case. So I'm gonna just close here by just saying, I love manipulation. When it's done well, it's like a dance. It's a beautiful therapeutic process. When it's done badly, it's like a car crash. Less is more. We don't need to smash the patient through the table to try and elicit a response. We should use manipulation as part of our treatment process and it shouldn't be the sole treatment process. You have to look at the biopsychosocial aspects, the education of the patient. We have to look at manipulation as an adjunct to exercise rehabilitation. It has to be part of that process, okay? You have to have thought process to why you're using a technique, all right? So uh, my fourth book comes out in April and that is on advanced osteopathic and, uh, and chiropractic manipulation techniques. There is links to my research that I'm sure Rohit will talk about and that is uh, that was published in 2019. It's an Elvis, Elsevier peer-reviewed journal um, and that was published in the Journal of Integrative Medicine and it's titled Spinal Manipulation. Is it all about the brain? Because ultimately guys, touch the skin, we touch the brain. We are having a significant neurophysiological response on the body. Um, and I think it's really important that we uh, take that on board. Um, follow us on Instagram, OMT Training 8989 if you want to have a look at some of the techniques that we do. Um, and if you want to read some of the stuff, please feel free to do so. All I would say is keep an open mind, always be questioning, always be learning. And ultimately, at the end of the day, as Hippocrates said, do no harm, uh, you know, risk and reward. Ultimately, I'm not going to do a therapeutic modality if it's ever going to put the patient at risk. So use techniques that are appropriate for that specific person. Have a great time. Learn loads. Network. Sending you lots of love from England. Happy days.